Welcome to More Real Today, where we break down topics that matter, mind, heart, and soul. And breakthrough to solutions you can use to improve your life or business today. I'm your host, Maril Salise Paz, and this week's topic is culture. If you think culture is just about arts and cocktails, then this show will make you think again. Let's get to it. Hello and welcome to the show. I am thrilled you could join us for what I think will be a very eye-opening show with our guest Gregorio Luque. He's the former guest of MOLA, the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach, and now Gregorio lectures worldwide on the topic of culture from many different angles, including art, film, education, and how culture can be an agent of transformation. Gregorio, welcome to the show. My, my first, I'm just curious about this, how did you fall in love with culture? Well, I, I was born into it, really. Uh, my mother was a, a famous uh, choreographer and dancer, and uh, and since I, before I could walk or talk, my mother used to. Uh, I grew up in a bag of toe shoes. Oh. My mother used to bring me to the rehearsals, and used to stick me there in the toe shoes so that I, I could not stand by myself. And eventually, the the dancers that were not dancing used to cuddle me and. and and I, I grew up looking at them dancing and hearing music and uh, sharing this world that for me is completely natural. I, I'm literally a, a creature of the theater. And then, you know, with, uh, with the time, my mother used to uh, take me to museums. I remember in New York looking at the sculptures of Alexander Calder, you know, the mobiles that were so impressive to me. And, uh, and then the books, the art books of Picasso, they were always there in the house. And then she used to read to me uh, from children's books, and then we went on to others. And, uh, and so all of this was really much part of, of the world that I, that I knew, that I grew up in. Were you actually born in the United States? Because you're Mexican background, yes? Yes, yeah, so I was born in Mexico, uh, but the, my early childhood was spent uh, between New York and uh, a tiny place in Mexico called Pichucalco. You see, my mother had a company in New York that performed uh, sometime, and then uh, she accepted contracts to stage ballets in Chile or Argentina or Brazil. And so sometimes I went to live with my grandmother, but others, I was sent to uh, a town in Chiapas that is called Pichucalco, that was a town of a couple of thousand people. And to me, the big city was not Manhattan and was not Mexico City. It was Pichucalco, because there uh, the kids could, could walk freely. You did not uh, need uh, an adult supervisor. supervisor. You could just walk freely, and you could go to the movies by yourself. And so I remember this thrilling experience when I was eight, nine, to be uh, free and to go at my own pace wherever I wanted um, and to discover the cinema and, and the radio because at, you know, in that time there was no television, and so uh, I could hear in the radio Calimán and other uh, radio series, Tres Patines, and I could listen to that. Then my mother got a contract to direct a company in Mexico City, and, and we, were, we moved to Mexico City. But this early childhood of living in, in different worlds was also important in shaping my, my view of the world. Was this... Uh traveling back and forth and experiencing different cultures and contexts, what kind of also led you to want to you know, really research and study? You, you lecture now on culture. Was this something that your travels and your background with your mom helped you kind of get into? Or want to focus on more than anything? Well, uh, I think it happened a little bit later. My mother always read to me. You know, I learned English because my mother uh, my parents divorced, and so in Mexico, uh, we, everybody spoke Spanish. And so my mother uh, read to me books in English with the idea that I would learn the language, and she succeeded at that. So I had an early exposure to, uh, to Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and all these wonderful books. And then I remember in, in fifth grade uh, when a teacher used to te introduce us to poetry. It was just mm -hmm. transformational for me. And later, in the Escuela Secundaria 3, where I studied 
my junior high school, uh, we had uh, what they call uh, speaking tournaments, oratoria. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, fell in love with the spoken word and, and making speeches and, 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 and debates and poetry and, and, and the use of the word, you know, that was very important to me. And then in high school, you know, in the 70s, we had uh, a lot of exiles that came from different parts of Latin America. Uh, in those years, there were a lot of military dictatorships in Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, many countries. And so a lot of these intellectuals or people that had been important in their countries were received in Mexico uh, as exiles. And uh, some of them had been very prominent in their own countries. And I remember that they became our teachers. And I will never forget those teachers and the way that they spoke to us and the way that they really conveyed a sense of the world. I remember these teachers that spoke of history and uh, spoke of Simón Bolívar. And you can imagine this man and his horse riding and, and talked about all these things. And it was just such, a, such a, a, a fantastic experience that I dreamed of someday being able to do that. You know? So I guess this early idea of using the the, the spoken word as a way of triggering imagination was something that, even though I had first heard it with my mother, but it really caught on in my participation in student debates and, 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 and speeches, but especially when I saw the example of these wonderful men that were dramatic and powerful and eccentric and, and interesting. And uh, that reminds me of. You've mentioned to me before in our conversations, you said teachers are not really performers. And if they were, you know, classes and classrooms would be completely different. Tell me a little bit about this idea. I think that the, the greatest harm to our education system has happened because we have limited the freedom of our teachers and, 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 and we have limited their ability to perform. We have made them almost like uh, administrators of learning instead of performers. And I think this is very sad. You know, uh, we have an excessive meddling of politics in the classroom where they tell a teacher not just what he should teach or she should teach, but they almost, uh, the, the syllabus is so limited and limiting that they have to teach it specifically this content in this way, exactly. And then there is, of course, the pressure of uh, passing standardized tests that also limits the ability to the teacher to create. And, 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 and also, uh, I'm, I find uh, very disturbing that our teachers are not trained to use their, their word. I mean, it's almost like the art of the spoken word, the art of rhetoric, that has always been fundamental in teaching from the time of the Greeks, right, right. Uh, is now uh, a forgotten art. And I think that one of the problems that we have in our education systems is that a lot of our classrooms and a lot of our, our, our places where the teachers are not free and where the learning is boring, where our children are unsatisfied, where they're desperate to get on their iPhones and, and, and get out of it, where they don't find any stimulation. I think that uh, our teachers should be given the freedom to make their own interpretation of history. And I think they should be given the training to be able to communicate and to do that in a dramatic and intense manner. We should produce uh, the, a similar reaction in our classrooms that when you look at a theater performance, I really believe that we should train our teachers. How is it possible that our teachers never receive a voice class? never receive mm. uh, an improv class. They should have all these tools at their disposal. I totally agree with you, but what about, you said they should be able to interpret. Do we get into a little bit of a dangerous line there if they're given the freedom to interpret what they need to teach or no? Of course, and that's, a great, that's very important. Uh, people have to make their, you know, their, the, the knowledge your own. You mm. cannot betray the subjectivity of a person. We are uh, a result of our lives and the vision of the world that we have. And, and, uh, and we should be able to express our convictions and our ideas. And of course, you, you, you have a, a common history and you have a, uh, ideas and, and, and goals. 
But to me, when some of the most motivating moments in classroom was when, when we could talk about history and I could see that my teacher was not just a conveyor of a dead text, but was also giving us their thoughts and their ideas and, and what they thought about something. And that encouraged us to participate as well. You see, uh, the, the, the idea of student participation, I believe, is not exclusive with the idea of the great class. Mm. As a matter of fact, I think that the teacher should be able to give a class. And, 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 and that does not inhibit, it stimulates the young people to participate and to come up with their own voice. Mm. Nothing was more motivating for us in fifth grade than to have a teacher that would declaim poetry and that would burst into eloquence. And that made it okay for us to do the same and to look at knowledge as something that is alive. That is what we need. We need to encourage the idea of a living history, of a living culture. If, if all we're doing is, is, is a dead culture, if, 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 if there is no emotion, if there is no subjectivity, if there is no appropriation of that knowledge, what we have is nothing. And, and what we have is, 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 is even more dangerous because uh, what we're looking at is uh, millions of young people that seem to be drowning in, 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 in ignorance. Uh, tragically, you ask a, a majority of our high school students uh, who is Eisenhower and they don't know. Yeah, or who is, is Roosevelt or who, what happened in World War I, you see? Yeah. And the, the, the sad part about this is that now all this information is widely available. Anybody that has a computer and an internet connection can find all of these things easily and can explore almost anything. But if you do not give to that student that curiosity, there is a, a Russian phrase that I like a lot. It's called the iskra, which is that kind of spark. If you're not able to light that spark in the heart of people so that they can be, feel curious about Washington or Jefferson or Luther King or, or Caligula, anyone, and, 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 and help them to, to actually go and look for them themselves. If you cannot generate that interest in that moment, you're failing. I agree with you. I, I love your passion, and there's so much more that we need to talk about, film, etc. But we're going to take a quick break and be right back with Gregorio Luque and more about how culture plays a key role in our lives and in our families. Let me tell you about the toughest guy on earth. He has the crazy strength to lift the man that raised him up without even flinching. This guy, no. This warrior will always be by his father's side, even if his dad will hardly remember. If this guy isn't the toughest guy on the planet, then I don't know who is. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Hey, look, it's those guys. Are you good to try? I'm fine. How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be? Go and step out of the vehicle for me. See ya, buddy. Good luck. So it turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing. And it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. Welcome back to the conversation with Gregorio Luque on the topic of culture. Gregorio, well, you've mentioned this to me before. You watch films with your daughter, and you really believe that culture, film, art, etc., could be a force for uniting the family. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I think that uh, one of the saddest things that is happening uh, right now is the lack of communication between parents and kids. Uh, there's a movie out there called Eighth Grade, in which it has uh, several scenes that are pretty dramatic where you see that the father is trying to communicate with the daughter and the daughter is looking at an iPhone mm. and is interested in the iPhone and doesn't care at all what the father is saying and, and the conversation is completely superficial and there's nothing out there that is real. And so then the kids fall prey to a, 
a ruthless world. You know, it may not look like it, but to me, it's like a, a, a Lord of the Flies scenario where gossip and, and uh, intrigue and, and some of the worst passions come. And, uh, and again, you know, there is this kind of passivity and the same way that the teacher is inhibited in uh, giving a class because he's supposed to watch. I think that sometimes the parents are inhibited to grab the cell phone, forbid it in the dinner table. Uh, but in addition to repressive measures like this, like saying, oh, here is no, an iPhone's no media. free or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, I think that an, a useful way to, to introduce discussion is movies, films. Uh, so what I have done is, is uh, I've created my, uh, my little cinematheque at my house. And uh, I am an old-fashioned guy, and I like to I buy the actual DVDs, but you don't really need to do that. I mean, you can nowadays... I do, I do the same thing. Online, I mean, yes, of course, I have Netflix, but can, I... Uh, yeah. You can find all kinds of films right now. And so then I organize, I, I, I look at the movies, and I try to look at them in a way that is coordinated and organized. And I started to do this with, like, say, Oscar-nominated films. I was interested not just in the winners, but all the nominated films. So it's like a body of... 40 or 50 films uh, selected by a group that is knowledgeable about the subject. And so then I, I like to watch them in an organized manner with my children. So for example, let's say you watch Churchill and then you watch Dunkirk. And both of these movies give you uh, the same moment when Britain enters into World War II, but one from the perspective of the hierarchy of the Prime Minister Churchill, and the other from the perspective of the, the, the soldier. The, the front front. And so you see both of them. And, and, and then the, the, you talk about this. You get a 360 or at least, you know, both sides yes, of the story. Yes, you see it. Or, for example, uh, you want to talk about relationships with families. And then you see I, Tanya, and then you see the, the Russian film, very dramatic, Loveless, about this kind of horrible marriage. And then you look at uh, this other film uh, where the, the, you have a mom that is kind of has all kinds of problems, but she loves her kid, or whatever. You, you compare them, and you see, what, what did you see here? What did you see the other? So sometimes I, I, I like to do this. With my son, I, he's very interested in acting, and so I look at great actors. And so we've seen mm -hmm. performances of Marlon Brando, and De Niro, and Al Pacino, and Dustin Hoffman. Or with my daughter, I looked at all Maria Felix, and how does she do, and how does she deal with men? And now I'm looking at all Marilyn Monroe films, and I want to look at all the Audrey Hepburn movies. Or I look at great teachers together, and I get Lean on Me, and all these uh, movies uh, that have to do with teaching, Dead Poets Society, Stand and, Stand deliver. and deliver, and I can even throw in Bad Teacher of Cameron Diaz <laughs> as a counterexample. Sure. And you watch them, and then you talk about them, and, and you use them as a way of breaking the silence, the barriers of silence. And so I, I've tried to do that. And I have a, in my, I, I try to put a, a little YouTube channel, uh, Gregorio Luke. And I also have my webpage where I have radio shows. And I, and I think of manners that one can uh, break that, that, what I call it, like an electronic autism. Mm. Where, uh, where they're just, you're kind, or like zombie, right? We're, and and yeah. hey. The kids are not the only ones who are guilty of this. We ourselves, you know, I see a lot of couples, you got to dinner and you see the couples don't even communicate because they're just in the electronic, right? And then you go to the movies and you don't communicate then, but when you do it at home, you can discuss. But if and you that. see that, and, and then you see that movies that, that invite comparison, so you see several of the same subject, hmm, and then you think, or sports, you look at uh, uh, concussion and then you look at, uh, you know, this other documentary they did about doping. And so then you look at what's wrong with this? Why, why, or, or I, Tanya, you see them all together, you know? So I, I like to, I, I think that uh, reading the newspaper, to me, is very important. I, I, I think that uh, if I had access to the editors of the main newspapers, I would say, don't give up on print news. But the problem is that a lot of the kids don't have the opportunity. You give them a newspaper every day so that they can look at the pages and they can talk about it. Having a newspaper in your hand. It's totally different. There's something, and you know, um, I come from a newspaper background, right? And for me, there's something about being able to grasp the totality of one full edition, which you, can, you don't get that feeling online. You're looking at stuff and you don't know when the end of the world of that, you know, news cycle of the day is. 
you did, but when you grab the print edition, there's something where you're like, okay, I'm done. I got what I needed to get today. So I, I love that idea, and I love your strategy of, you know, doing the thematics with the the film. I think that's great. Or reading, you know, I I, I read uh, Huckleberry Finn. I have a whole sets of books that I that I read to the kids. Uh, I organize things. Uh, cooking together, doing things to break, uh, to go beyond that awful moment of silence where you're in the table and either, and, and nobody's, that, that, I think that's one of the loneliest things when you're with, with people that are not there. Their body is there, but they're not there. They're looking at an iPhone and they're doing something else and, uh, and this awful iciness of superficiality that, it, that sets in, that creeps in to life. So we must try to break that cycle by activities like these that I'm, that I'm mentioning, just the same way that in the classroom, a teacher should stand up and should say, and should move, get moved, and should talk about the battles, and should make us look at whatever he's talking about, and, he, and should make us aware of, of uh, the civil rights struggle. And then he should use videos, and he should use, I know we have all these resources, but if there is no passion, you know, uh, enthusiasm means that the word, the etymology, is that something enters, some spirit enters you. Mm. One has to believe in that. One has to be uh, excited about that. I, I like uh, a definition I like very much is of uh, rock and roller Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. And once they asked him if, if people went to see the Rolling Stones out of nostalgia, and he said, no, they, they see us because we are still a, a credible rock band. So the follow-up question was, what does it mean to be a credible rock band? And he said, to be a credible rock band, you have to have the capacity of exploding on stage. And so I like to tell my fellow friends and teachers, you have to be able to explode in the classroom. You have to be able to get there and just blow it all up and be exciting and be interesting. And, and you have to uh, break the sounds of silence. You know that, that famous song of Simon and Garfunkel that I find that is creeping up everywhere in our dinner tables, and the sounds of silence. This, this impossibility of communication. We have to break through and we have to be creative of, of how we produce discussions, how we get people out of their comfort zone, and how do we uh, recreate the most precious gift that we have, which is precisely the possibility of communicating with one another. And you're like the perfect example of this. <laughs> We're looking at you, you're so animated and so passionate about this, and this is why I wanted to have you here. Uh, one of the things I don't want to get away from us is I love how you say culture is an agent or can or has the possibility to be an agent of transformation. You've lectured around the world. What have you seen how culture can be transformative? Well, I think there's a phrase uh, they've attributed to Benjamin Franklin and also to Thomas Jefferson. I wouldn't be surprised if both had said it, uh, which is you cannot be ignorant and free. I think that a lot of the, uh, of the problems we're facing is uh, ignorance. Uh, an ignorant population and, and, and uh, an electorate that is not well informed, that is not well in, in contact with history, that, that is ignorant, is, uh, is a population in danger, in danger of the demagogue, in danger of... Uh, being manipulated? Being manipulated of, of totalitarian ideas, all these things. And so I believe that, uh, that we should struggle to to introduce culture, but not as, uh, uh, you know, as, as this inaccessible or, or, or snob behavior. Culture has a way of getting interested in, in what has happened and what is going on. And so my, what I do is I do lectures. And I'm trying to make lectures into a form of performing arts. I go to plazas and parks and I give lectures sometimes or, Last Saturday, I was at 600 people showed up. I've given lectures for 8,000 people. And, uh, and I think that more people should do that. I hope that more people like me, I'm, I'm, I tell people that I'm like Don Quixote, you know, <laughs> that have read too much and gone mad. And, think, and I think you know, that the word can liberate us and can make us free. Because I find that a lot of the so-called speakers are either people that are celebrities and they're speaking because they're famous or they're authors that are pushing a book or, or they are politicians that are project, pr pr proponing an agenda or preachers that are proponing a religion. And what I propose is culture. I like to give lectures on great writers, on, on great artists, on moments in history. Well, I love that and I think you are 
the good kind of mad. We should to take we should take the, the, those great professors and those people that are now in classrooms where 40 students or 30 or 20, and uh, and they should go out in the streets and they should use we should have the greatest teachers performing and sharing that knowledge it's almost like nowadays it's very difficult to access that because uh, the professors and the good professors are in the special elite universities some of them you have community colleges but it's always difficult to access it it's always difficult to attend uh, there's a lot of problems in the parking and so most people you know study when they're young and then that's it, right? And so I think that uh, what I'm proposing is that the class can also be a form of popular entertainment. And I think you're absolutely, absolutely right. And I hope that whoever's watching will get that message. Still to come, my conclusions on the topic and conversation, so stay with us. We'll be right back with Gregorio Luque. Regresando a la escuela, sí tenía miedo. No sabía si iba a poder hacerlo. Una de las maestras que está ahí es la señora Araceli. Ella siempre tomaba su tiempo ayudándome a mí. 50% es entrando por la puerta. El otro 50% es haciendo el trabajo. Nunca es muy tarde para obtenerlo. Encuentra clases gratis para adultos cerca de ti en completatudiploma.org. Llama al 1 971 2013 y obtén información para cuidar mejor a quien cuidó de ti. Here's what I want to leave you with. A visit to the museum, a ticket to a film festival, even the latest binge or marathon of your favorite series, all of those are great cultural activities. But culture doesn't stop there. Culture is family. It's bonding, it's educational, and it's transformative. Culture is history as well as modern society. It's where you live and how you live, as well as the vast variety of the people you know and love. Culture is key to understanding and relating, and it has a role to play in almost any area of life. My hope for you today is that you let culture be a transformative force in your life, and that you explore your past, present, and future with culturally curious eyes, and that you let the wealth of diversity in this world enrich your being one movie, one painting, or one lesson at a time. I'd like to thank my guest, Gregorio Luque, for all his insight and ideas on culture. Thank you to our wonderful sponsors, and as always, all my gratitude to and for my amazing crew. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Maril Tweets and Facebook and Insta at Maril Salis Paz for more insights and inspiration. Until next time, I'm Maril Salis Paz wishing you and yours paz, amor, y luz. Mm -hmm.